Oh, we're live. All right, hello everyone, and welcome to Building a World in Binary. Uh, we'd like to start by acknowledging that we're meeting on the traditional lands of the Noongar, Ganjagara, Wurundjeri and Bunurong people. We recognise their continuing connection to the land, waters and the community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders both past and present and to the people of the land wherever you are today. We feel very privileged to be able to continue a very rich history in telling stories on what always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So I thought we'd begin by having each one of us kind of introduce ourselves and show you around a little bit about our work. Uh, so Mez, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, sure. Why not? So I'm Mez Breeze. I'm a long time uh, digital creative artist, electronic literature boffin. Uh, my latest thing is virtual reality. As you can tell, I'm very hard to pin down in terms of labelling, uh, labelling which I like. Um, I've been creating in all of these areas for over two decades now. Yes, that does make me a dinosaur, but I'm a very interested, engaged, curious dinosaur. Um, I first started writing collaborative interactive fictions in chat rooms, and that was at the tail end of 1994. So, yeah, I've been at this a pretty long time. Um, I'm best known for my hybrid code English language system called Mesangle or Mesangel, if you're a bit fancier than I am. Um, and the theorist Catherine Hales describes this as, and this is the only quote that I'll have during the whole talk, a bilingual practice that breaks the convention, conventional link between phoneme and written mark forging new connections between code and English. So the most important thing about that is that I take, well, I, I, I have done, I'm not necessarily working in this mode at the moment, but I play and I play hard between the conventions of English, the English language, uh, the written mark and networked online conventions. That's the easiest way to, to put it. So yeah, I, I have been at this game for a long time. Lately, I've been focused on creating virtual reality experiences, uh, doing both the writing and in some case the narrative design for those, and in some case the whole shebang. So yeah, um, that's what's been the last four, four or five years. I've had a long history in terms of augmented reality and virtual reality, but yeah, that's that's kind of where my passion lies at the moment. But I started off making a work in the 1990s a browser-based work, HTML-based work, called Cutting Spaces. So I might just screen share that quickly. Uh, here we go. Now, this work is very basic, as you can see. It's uh, created in JavaScript and HTML. It basically is a non-linear narrative where I work in different identities. I don't want to talk too much about this work, but basically for 1994, this was pretty groundbreaking stuff. Hard to believe now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that that's this is one of the first works I played around with format, um, with different voices. I also uh, used the convention of an email structure in the work. So yeah, we won't go too much more into that. Uh, but yeah, that's that's one work that really helped shape a lot of the uh, themes that I'm working with even today. So we'll just switch over quickly to one of my more recent works. Uh, this is a work called Perpetual Nomads. Uh, it's a work that's created in virtual reality. This is just the, uh, the website for it. Um, obviously can't show virtual reality in, a, in the space we're in now. Um, this is the, the website. We've been lucky enough to, uh, you know, get a few accolades about it. But basically, it's uh, set in the inanimate Alice story world, which is a digital story franchise that's been ongoing for 10 years now. Uh, quite a few episodes have been developed, none in virtual reality. This is the first one in virtual reality. And you play as Alice in this uh, this work. 
you, you can run it as virtual reality. You can also run it as a uh, PC application. So there's different layers to the work. We've also recently finished a 360 version of the work that runs 23 minutes, which is very interesting. Um, so these are just some of the, in the background, you can see a few of the, the screenshots from that work. Really interesting process to do. It's a co-production between Australia and Canada. Um, the logistics involved were great, a great learning curve, worked with a good team. Yeah, so that's, um, and I was uh, the lead writer on the project amongst a whole lot of other things, narrative designer, co-producer, project manager, dog's body, you know, coffee gatherer, all of that. So, yeah, so that that's another work that I've uh, that I've recently just finished, actually. Um, and a final work that I just wanted to touch on because I absolutely love it and it's uh, a work where I get to marry my love of uh, illustration and visual art, in this case, 3D models, with my love of text. So this is a work called A Place Called Ormelsey, set in the world of Ormelsey, and it follows a very cartoonish, clumsy fellow called Mr. Ormel. Now, Mr. Ormel absolutely loves where he lives, starts off in a beautiful, you know, really naive, simplistic st stylization. Um, and if I was to press on this big button here, what would happen is that that window would turn into a 3D set. So you could move the world around. I won't actually do it because it's a bit glitchy and I, I I don't want to, you know, bugger the stream. Um, but you can move it around and annotations pop up where the actual text, the core of the story is formed. So we move through uh, all of these chapters and it gradually gets darker, the imagery gets more, you know, menacing. And in the end, I won't show you the end one because that's very spoilery. Um, you work out that this wonderful world of Ormelsey isn't as it seems. So, yeah, that this work in particular is one that I'm really um, enamoured with at the moment and uh, I'm really kind of pushing hard because it has social commentary at its core. Perpetual Nomads, my other work, does as well, but this is a very dystopic look at what's uh, a commentary on what's happening, what I see is happening in, in a global sense in the world today. So yeah, and there'll be, I think we're um, going to whack up links at the end of the talk about that. So I think that's probably enough for me. And yeah, back to you, Karen. Cool. And I do strongly suggest you check out a place called Ormelsey in particular, having played around with that a little bit. It's absolutely worth the time. Um, on a completely different note, if you see me looking down and away from the screen, I'm actually keeping an eye on Twitter on my phone. So you can tweet through any questions you've got for us while we're live using the hashtag DWF18. And we'll leave some time at the end to answer questions. All right, Gemma, did you want to share some of your work? Um, yep. So my name is Gemma Mahadio and I'm a writer predominantly of poetry and non-fiction. And at the beginning of this year, I did a Women Writers um, of Colour Commission. The theme was collaboration. And so I decided to write three poems about three video games that um, were exhibited at Bar SK in Collingwood. I'll just get the poems up. Oops. I need to press in Shepherd. Um, so won't let me move that out of the way. Um, so the first poem that you can see there is supposed to be a test pattern in three languages. This was a poem for um, Ian McClarty's Catacombs of Solaris which also won an award at this year's free play. It's this kind of um, scrolling, amazing uh, vomit of pixels just constantly at you. And whenever you stop moving, um, the color palette changes. Wow. 
So I decided to try and make a test pattern out of words um, in three languages. So um, Tagalog is my mum's language. That's her native language. And in Tagalog, we don't have a word for grey. So at the bottom, it translates, it isn't white, it isn't black. Um, the second poem that I wrote was a, a more narrative one about, um, it's called The Innovative Food Company, that was the name of the game. And I started each stanza of the poem with WASD because they were the movement keys. It just seemed like a cute um, constraint to have. But I br broke out of that in the last stanza because that's kind of also breaking the fourth wall of the narration. Um, and then the last one, which is by Play Reactive, which is called The Best Thing. So you have two, um, two choices up on the screen and then you press a button to choose which one first. So what I did was I sat down and did it by myself and then recorded every single round. Um, I jotted down the word that I'd chosen for each round and any round where a word was mentioned three or more times um, I made a, a smiley face out of, I, yeah, arranged the words into a smiley face. <laughs> so, yeah, you can see music is, I think, my top word, um, cats and tea. Also <laughs> awesome. Major priorities. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, as they should be, as they should be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was, I guess, um, Poetry has been my main foray into um, experimenting a bit more with digital work and working online. Um, I also blog, um, and I just also wanted to show another poem that, so the, the, the games, the video game poems are called ekphrastic poems, which sounds really uh, fancy. Um, and this one is for, if it's working. Uh, Alexander Perrin's short trip. So it's this um, beautiful game where you're a cat and you get to go on a tram and ride up this beautiful, what looks like European sort of landscape. And initially what I wanted to do was arrange the words so that they looked like that. Um, but eventually it just became an acrostic but if you can see, I've handwritten um, some stuff. So that was what it was supposed to look like, but I sort of ran out of time. So I just ended up printing it up. Um, and all the lines, um, so short trip by Alexander Perrin runs um, down like a column. And th uh, there's text on either sides of that letter, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and the last, thing I wanted to share. You can, you can see my cats just stepping on my keyboard. Yay! Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so Vanessa Berry has written this amazing psychogeographic um, chronicle about Sydney and it's called Mirror Sydney. And so I thought I would try to write a queer disabled book review about it. And it's important to note that the, the review's not, not finished. I only um, treated the four compass points. And let's see if it will work when I go into the link. Maybe not. Oh, yep, here we go. Um, yeah. So yeah, so it starts off, it and it's super super boring. Like design people are probably um, rolling their eyes, going, "Oh my goodness, this is this is just so blah." But it's supposed to be blah. So click on the contents, and then you can read any of those in any order you want to. Or you can pick a compass point and learn some stuff. 
but it's yeah it's literally just a list of things i really love lists i love using lists in poems as well because <laughs> um they can i don't know they can sound really boring but i think lists actually tell you a lot about things and people um Yeah, and this was all, this was also inspired by my um, the classifications were inspired by a year eight subject that I did um, called people, places, and time, which sounds really simplistic, but also sounded like a really nice starting point and quite accessible. And this was made in Twine. Yeah, Twine. Yeah, that's it. Cool. All right, I guess I'll go next. Uh, so I'm Karen Lowry. Uh, I did my PhD in digital poetry at Curtin. I now work as a lecturer, so I teach uh, film, uh, post-production and web design at SAE Institute. Just share my screen with you all. All right, I'm gonna start by talking about this work. Um, so this is a more recent work that I made. I actually started it about a year and a half ago and I only finished it in September this year. And I had a poem that I'd written when I was going through depression myself. I've suffered from PTSD, a post-traumatic stress disorder. And I really wanted to create something that would capture what it feels like when you don't have control over your thoughts and you're kind of being bombarded with all these negative thoughts that are just taking over. Um, so I decided to create an interactive work to do that online as I felt I'd be able to capture it better uh, using technology than if I'd done something in print. And I'll play a little bit of it. I won't play all of it. But what I wanted to do was subvert the notion of interactivity. When we in have a, on online work or any kind of form of electronic literature, we expect to be able to interact with and change the text. So what I've done is had the words print one at a time. And once you press play, that's the only control you as the reader actually have over the work. So once the work starts playing, you can't control the speed the words come at. And I really wanted to have it so that the words would build up and you'd start to feel out of control and have trouble reading. So I'll just play a little bit of it. So while that's kind of, I'll leave that to play through, but what I really struggled with this particular work is I was trying to capture that idea of having no control for the reader, but I actually had all of the control in deciding the timing for how these would print. So I, um, I, I, I do code and this was written using HTML and CSS for the interface. And then I used JavaScript to actually get the words printing. And in doing that, every time I played the work, I could go back to the code and tweak it. So it was an interesting process for me to be taking this poem that I'd written when I felt like I had no control and just needed to get these thoughts out, to then having complete control over them and being able to adjust that timing. We'll switch over. All right, so the other one I'm gonna show is Page and Pal. And this is a work by David Thomas Henry Wright for a shortlisted novella of his. And I created the digital interface uh, for the work. So this was a very different process because I didn't actually write any of the artifacts you're gonna see in the work. The, uh, again, the illustration here was made by Julia Lane. And what I did was create this interface. And there are a few little touches that I did make in this work. So this was shortlisted for the Queensland Literary Awards in 2017. Um, and an example of some of the touches is you can use uh, these arrows to bring up the footnotes. And David's original idea was to have arrows for the entire work. So with the top here, you can select to put the footnotes on and uh, these uh, track changes, sorry, on for the entire work. And what I did, what I suggested instead was having the option to toggle the individual track changes on so that you could control what you saw. 
And then the same for the poem, there's the little touch here was to bring this uh, message up rather than having it on a sheet of paper, trying to recreate that phone interface again. But it was a very different experience creating this work because I could be creative and I could think about ideas I could connect to the work without having ownership, I guess, over the words that I was actually playing with and using. All right, so what I thought we'd do is I've got some questions here to kind of delve into how we create work a bit more and how others can create work and start playing around in this field. So I thought I'd start by asking you guys what you, how you actually create your work. So what software programs do you use? Do you use any program languages? And are there any barriers to entry for you when creating creating digital work? Did you want me to leap in? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, for, for me, any type of creation that I'm doing, and this is across the board, whether it's, you know, electronic literature or 3D modelling or anything, it always starts from a place of curiosity. So, you know, whether I'm kind of kicking around a, a particular subject or theme or intent on using um, software or playing, you know, and, and sometimes breaking hardware, um, I really get a, a kick out of uh, using it all in unconventional ways. So sometimes I'm, I'm a terrible manual reader. Like, you know, you, you throw a program at me and the first thing I do is I want to break something or I want to try and use the, you know, the, the UI to the point where it shouldn't be used or, or something. So I guess um, in terms of actual work creation, play and exploration is so crucial to what I do. And it, it's funny because looking at both of your work, Gemma and Karen, um, Gemma, I absolutely love like the short trip poem I just went, that's, you know, so in my wheelhouse, fantastic. And also Karen with the uh, depression work, that notion of subverting the idea of interactivity is just, it's so powerful because we we so these days just expect interactivity and and that that's a, a benchmark of immersion so yeah i guess i'm when you guys were talking about that i was really going how does that kind of fit into what i do and that notion of exploration i think links the three of our work pretty heavily which is great um so in terms of the software program languages that i use um Basically, when I first started out, I was using, as I showed you in Cutting Spaces, uh, online chat programs. Um, I was also using Unix and Shell-based technology just to play around in chat rooms and to really look at how communication was constructed back then. Just, I know most of you can't even imagine a time without the internet, but some of us lived through that. <laughs> and it was, yeah, it was really interesting to kind of lurch from pre-internet to post-internet and also the use of the browser because back then the browser was king. Um, in 1994, when I first did Cutting Spaces, I think Mosaic and maybe it was 95 when Netscape Navigator came in, can't remember. But that was so, it was the framework for all of this amazing creativity and connecting with people across the world and, and email um, was just such a new thing that what I did is I went, right, of course, I've got to take all of this technology and all these puzzle pieces and do something with it. So proceeded in these chat rooms that were just, you know, think of social media back when there was no glitzy interface, just text on the screen, communicating with someone, say, in Silicon Valley or the UK or Nepal or, you know, wherever, and then creating fictions Sometimes they weren't even aware that they were in the fiction and running with that. Um, a very interesting way to create interactive fiction. So basically these days I've kind of, I haven't shifted away from that, but I'm on hiatus, let's say, from that. And um, I use a lot of VR technology. So uh, this year I've been obsessed with uh, creating 3D models that exist in a VR space. Um, also, VR apps like Masterpiece VR, 
Tilt Brush, which is Google's uh, painting slash sculpture VR technology, um, porting those into, exporting what I do in there, uh, porting them into Sketchfab, which is what I use to create the 3D sets in a place called Ormalsy. Um, and sometimes using Unity, a, a traditional game engine technology, WebVR, still use JavaScript. Um, and the important thing with all of that is to cobble it all together. I think of it as digital tinkering um, and see what comes out. And the process is really important, but there's so many other works that I haven't finished because the process is kind of juvenile. Me mashing all this stuff together is wonderful for me, but I've got to be able to produce a work out of it that is, you know, that stands up. So, you know, you'd be very interested to see my hard drive and to see all of these unfinished projects. Um, but that does lead on to barriers to entry. It is very expensive to produce this work in terms of especially using virtual reality gear. It's not cheap. If you're going for the high-end stuff, that really is a significant barrier to entry. So what I do in my works is I try and provide multiple entry points. Um, in a place called Ormalsy, you can view that work just as text. If you just read the text, you'd still have the core of the story. If you were to, say, use low-end VR tech like a Google Cardboard headset, you'd still be able to get the gist of the work. You'd have a different layer of the work, but you know it, it would be like an extension of the text. If you use your mobile phone and all you do is whack it up on a browser and, and press one of these play buttons, you again get a different version of the work. So accessibility is important to me, especially after coming off the back of Perpetual Nomads, which is such a high end, you know, tech heavy work that that's really important. So that that is a, a, a pretty huge barrier to entry that, um, you know, digital creatives really have to look at if they're going for more um, extended reality tech. Yeah. Well, uh, I actually started off in Twine rather than in programming. My background, while I teach web design now, my background wasn't in programming at whatsoever. And it's the, like, I was the per I failed maths in high school. So I did, I did intro calculus in year 11 and I failed that. I also did chemistry and I failed that. I think I ended up at like 17% for intro calculus as my end of year mark. So like I was the last person I thought would end up going into any kind of STEM field. Um, and when I eventually started learning programming, it was because I'd gotten to a point in Twine where, and if you don't know Twine, the barrier to entry for Twine's really low. Anyone can get online and start making kind of an interactive hypertext work. Um, and I've taught a lot of workshops about how you can do that in Twine in um, one, two hours, have your own work up and running. Fantastic. But, yeah, I'd gotten to this point where I wanted it to do more than it was doing. So I was starting to look at uh, JavaScript and CSS and kind of hacking bits into Twine. And if you use Twine now, Twine's got this wonderful online interface that's really easy to use. But when I was uh, hacking away at Twine and trying to add my own code, I was using the older version where you downloaded and used it offline. And I'd kind of gotten to a point where my husband, who's a software developer, had pretty much said to me, this is going to be a lot easier if you just make it yourself because that's not what this program is made for. Right. Uh, so he started teaching me code because I went, all right, well, you know how to do this stuff. Can you, can, can you teach me? And for a little while, teach me simply meant he wrote the code for me and explained what it was doing. And the reason why is he's not, he's not a teacher um, and – he, if, the way that we taught for a little while was he would explain to me the way something worked. I wouldn't get it. He'd explain it again. And every time he explained it, his voice would get a little bit louder. And <laughs> it meant that we weren't really getting anywhere except really pissing each other off. And it, the reason why is there are a lot of times where my husband would go, when this happens, you've got to do that. And I'd want to understand why do I do that in this particular situation? Uh, what's the process behind that? And a lot of times in code, there just isn't one. It's just remember the rule. This happens, do that. And the way that I ended up getting around that was eventually I told my husband, can you give me a metaphor instead? 
I get that that just happens, but try giving me a metaphor or something to understand why this is actually happening. And from that point onwards, because my background is in poetry, we did relatively fine and I picked up most of it without any problems. And I went from creating works in HTML, CSS and JavaScript and started picking up other programming languages like PHP, which is what uh, WordPress uses, the foundations of WordPress, and started playing around with other JavaScript libraries as well. And again, it came to me through just sheer stubbornness, I guess, <laughs> in that I had an idea in my head of what I wanted to do with the work and I needed to learn the code in order to make that happen. But I think the fact that the process I went through in learning, for me, I think the act of actually learning code, there's a really perceived massive barrier to entry there that people think it's quite hard to learn. And in my experience, especially now, it really isn't. So I think there's a perception that there's a big barrier to entry there, but that barrier doesn't really exist. Nowadays, our Code Academy, if you want to get into CSS and HTML, is really good. It's free to use. The tutorials that they have, the H introduction to HTML only takes four hours, and it's really simple. And there's so many resources like that out there now. I've recently started volunteering my time in Perth at a group called Perth Web Girls, and that focuses on doing one-day free workshops for girls to get them programming and learning different languages. So there are so many ways that you can learn learn these skills now. And maybe a couple of years ago, it would have been more difficult, but there are resources out there now. That means I think that we're getting to a point where that barrier to entries, for me, at least it was in my head because I told myself that that was a STEM thing. It was a science thing. It was something my husband could do and I couldn't. And for me, it was breaking that barrier down so that I could see that, you know, it's, something that's just as easy for me to learn and to experiment with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, I say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, wow, it's, uh, so my story's almost completely different to Karen's in that when I was at high school, I did all the maths and sciences and at the very last minute decided um, I was going to study music like you do yeah, yeah. <laughs> um i auditioned and i got in and i yeah there was just no way i was going to turn that down um i also did a, an arts degree and started reading lots started writing my own poetry because i started enjoying so much of what i was reading and then about a decade ago lived with um some cis admins and i don't know how they managed to convince me that I, I, I was apparently smart enough for this, but they said, oh, yeah, come on, run Linux on your laptop. Sorry, Linux on your laptop. And I can remember thinking, no way, it's just going to be too hard. But And it was hard, but I gave it a go. And I feel like that doing that and, um, and writing online generally has changed um, my my personal syntax like the way i write my poetry wow sometimes i try to make it very um like i, I use a lot of symbols in in ways that um kind of remind me of coding um like underscores or the um the asterisks but it's um yeah kind of like an alternative to italicizing or um, putting things in bold. Um, yeah, because I have I have no background in programming. Although um, I started a WordPress blog when I think when WordPress first started, and pretty much kind of amazing to think that um, I basically just kept learning that. And so now I happen to know a lot about WordPress, but that was just because I happened to pick it up at the time. Yeah, now that uh, that makes sense. Like that's. The only reason I can code is the same, kind of the same background as you. You know a lot about WordPress because you you were interested in that field. You were interested in having a blog, so you just kind of learnt. Yeah, and it was much the same for me. It was like once I'd gotten the first kind of CSS and HTML down as basic programming languages, it was just a case of wanting to do something. And before you know it, you just kind of know how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> 
So do you guys think that there's like a real difference in terms of gender pathways? Like we, we're all describing how we essentially kind of fell into it, not exactly by accident, but that, you know, it was, it, our career pathways kind of converged to a point where we went, oh yeah, we really want to achieve something. So we'll learn coding to, to kind of do that. So do you think, I just keep going, I wonder if the, um, Karen, you're talking about metaphors. That's really, really interesting. And Gemma, you're talking about the framework where you kind of extract, you know, you're talking about underscores, asterisks. I, I can really resonate with that as well, that there's something different in terms of um, genders and how we approach this, or am I just drawing a very long bow? I think... For me, the issue for a long time was, and again, I can't speak for all women or all men, but the way that my husband learnt how to code and the way my husband was able to learn in a STEM field was very different to the way I needed to learn. So for a long time, a lot of the resources I was seeing was catered to the way that my husband learnt, and it meant I just wasn't getting it. And that's why I was really lucky that I did have my husband who's an expert in this field. And so when I'd worked out and I'd kind of worked out that that was the issue and it was the way it was being taught that was the problem and I'd suggested that using metaphors would help, I was really lucky that I had someone there who could reframe what I was trying to learn in a way that I'd be receptive to. Yeah. So less to do with gender and more to do with the institutionalized structures of learning i think so yeah i think yeah yeah it was how it was how it was being taught almost like i mean i mean this was a little while ago now and a lot of the resources out there now are much better but it was being taught almost like they were just kind of facts to learn do the like do do this when that happens and i needed some kind i kept asking why and getting hung up on the why and that prevented me from actually being able to apply that particular technique in other situations. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. I think um there's a lot of that as well with classical music training. It felt so rigid that I felt that I wasn't being as creative as I could be because I was just working towards an ideal of perfection that just couldn't exist. And I actually have overuse in both of my arms as a result. Oh no. Um, but it's not it's not RSI, so it's not quite as bad. But I can't play the flute for any um, for yeah the amount of hours that I used to be able to play. Oh. But I think it was it, it was also a mixed blessing because the poetry I've never felt like I, I'm only just starting to feel comfortable calling myself a poet and feeling that the work I produce is um, is valid and is worthy of being called poetry as well as learning that art is supposed to move people. So there will be lines um, or there will be words that, you know, you can't always find the perfect word that says exactly what you want to say. Because I also look at poetry as it's manipulation of you. You are manipulating your reader. You want your reader to read your work in a very, very specific way down to the line breaks um, space on the page, how you put it out, and you can only do that so much. Some of that, some of it is still going to be how does how does a reader how does a reader react to your work, and also they can interpret it in completely different ways that you would not even have considered. So they also become an author as well, like a, a yeah. collaborator. Yeah. See, I I actually. I've always done this in whatever creative pursuit that I, you know, get, sink my teeth into. What I do is I try and create whatever I'm doing with embedded layering so that personal connection, that authoring by the audience member is catered mm -hmm. for. So I, I very rarely will go, right, this work is finished to the point that there's one interpretation 
and there's one, you know, meaning set or that I really want to get out there, I just go, no. And there's nothing better than listening to people who don't know that you're the author or the creator of a work and seeing what they think because negative or positive, doesn't matter what the feedback is, yeah. because it's always so staggering to go, oh, my God, I never, ever thought that that's what, you know, would, would have been interpreted from 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 my work and that's the power of what we do I think I, I I absolutely love that once you put your work out there it's not yours anymore there's yeah. multiple authors in terms of how how they interpret and it's funny because I can remember going to an art gallery with an ex once and we're standing in front of a painting and he went oh what does that mean I better get a you know audio tour thing to find it and I went no no just what do you get from it? What does it mean to you? And it was like a revelation. He went, oh, right. So there's not an actual established right way to look at the work or right right interpretation. Yep. Mine's just as valid as some wanky art critic who, you know, gets paid a million bucks to do this. And I went, yeah. <laughs> that, oh. and, and that's what's so staggering. And I know there's so much built into that in terms of, you know, sellability of the work. It has to meet a certain standard. There's, you know, uh, this is almost a naive approach. But that that authoring that you refer to from from the audience is just, it's something that fuels me to to create work that can be interpreted in multiple ways. You know, that's, that's very powerful. Yeah, and there was something you said as well before when you were talking about classical music and kind of the learning being very rigid and like stifling creativity a little bit. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons I struggled with learning code in the beginning is it didn't feel very creative. But that's actually what I like the most about it now. Because when I'm creating a work, there is that sense that I put it out and there's so many different ways people can read it and interpret it. And that can be quite scary. Whereas with code, and my husband hates it when I say this, but it either works or it doesn't. <laughs> and the reason my husband doesn't like that is because you can still have it working and have it really badly written. Or okay. have, yeah, or, you know, you, you don't have it commented or it can still be messy. But ultimately, it does what it's supposed to or it's not going to do it. Yeah. And nice break from create doing doing something really creative where it is scary putting that work out there and putting those thoughts out there and wondering how people will take it to writing code and bringing it up on the web page and just seeing it work and do what it's supposed to yeah yeah absolutely All right, uh, so the next question I've got is how do you use the, and we've touched on this a little bit already, uh, how do you use the capabilities of the web and how is this different to, if this, to stories that do exist in print? So I guess this is more a question about interactivity and so we touched on this a bit already. Like as I said, I deliberately subverted the interactivity in my work to try and make the reader feel to try and show what it feels like to be trapped when you're having negative thoughts or in the middle of a panic attack. So what kind of ways do you guys play with interactivity and use the web in ways that change your story? Um, I'm working on a video game at the moment with Ian McClarty, so the um, person that created Catacombs of Solaris. And it's going to be one where you walk around um, and the landscape's kind of made up of text or letters, but at certain points, um, a poem will pop up at particular types of things. So there's going to be a really ugly brown, black, white chevron 70s rug. <laughs> um, I think the next poem I'll, I'll start writing is a tumbleweed. So what, when the tumbleweed um, rolls past you, um, and the second one that I have already written is the fence post. So you, you're putting your hand up to a fence post and when you stroke it downwards, it feels one way, but upwards, um, it feels like it's going to, you feel like you're going to get splinters in your fingers. Wow. So that's one of the more stereotypical um, poems, but yeah, it's gonna be a mix of different poems and hopefully because I, I remember playing Catacombs of Solaris and my, my my initial impression, like I just felt like a kid. I was just 
fixated on the screen, my jaw had dropped and I was staring going, wow, this is so amazing. And I get so many moments like that with indie games in particular. It's like, it's really nice to have that permission to be in touch with that, that childlike wonder, which again, I think is something that we sometimes lose track of in creativity. So yeah. So hoping to do, I guess, hoping to inspire some of that wonder in in that um, in that work. So Gemma, if you were to take the the poems that you're constructing, you know, in your your game design work or your collaborative work, or yeah. or, or say even um, you were talking about the fence post stroking it one way, you'd get splinters stroking it, stroking it down ways, a different effect would happen. How would if if you took away the actual technology? behind it so if you just had a say a physical uh, like a, a textual description mm -hmm. of that fence post what do you think is the, the key differences is it that you know the 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 visual kind of stunning aspect the interactivity is removed is that what drives the core of the work or what you know what messages kind of come across that differ from what could be printed out on a page um it's so in terms of when you explore the landscape you don't know when you're going to come across the poems okay so serendipity almost yeah okay yeah and you don't know what kinds of poems you're going to come across so some some things might some objects might seem really major but then some might seem really silly and a fence post in out in outdoor sort of the settings kind of like um i guess the the outback or a a large right. property okay um, doesn't sound um you, you know it sounds pretty stereotypical it's not yeah not rare or anything yeah but, but that's then, yeah. that's when you can do the most amazing moments like everyday kind of objects that you go oh yeah walk past that fence post yep you know if you if you do reach out in a sense and touch it you, oh the, yeah the effect that you can have using that as a mechanism to convey an aspect of the story or you know the experience is incredible yeah i'm i'm feeling that with a lot of the vr stuff that i'm doing at the moment because taking text and experiencing that in a fully immersive you know, you, you, your senses are completely co-opted into this space. You put on a headset in terms of the high-end VR gear. You can't hear anything from the outside world. You can't see anything from so-called real reality. And it's amazing because the you're talking about manipulation, you know, poetry being manipulation before. It's such a huge responsibility for a friend yeah. you know, <laughs> to do that. Um so I, I guess in terms of getting back to your question, Karen, um, I've used, uh, you know, the network rather than the web, but networked communication for so long in terms of creativity that I guess maybe I've switched a bit away from that to using the web more as a distribution or publish, uh, publishing mechanism. So you can basically download what I do or, or, you know, look at what I do rather than the intricacies that I would have once used it for. Um, that's not to say I won't get back to it again because God knows I, these things are cyclical. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess that's in in terms of what I'm doing now, that's how I use the capabilities of the web. That's interesting though because that leads to another question I've got. I'm keeping an eye on the time. I haven't seen any questions oh. come up, so I'm going to ask the next question. But if you, if you do have any questions yourself, just use the hashtag DWF18 and I'll just yeah, we'll hold to what we're doing and come straight to your question. <laughs> All right, so it was interesting, though, that you said, Mez, that you use uh, the internet a lot for distribution now. Because one thing I thought it would be interesting to discuss is what avenues there are available for publication of digital work and how you share it and help it find an audience. When I first came into this field, that was what I encountered the most with people, is people going, but how are you going to make money from it? How are you going to share it on the internet when there's so many other websites out there already people could be experiencing? And it's the biggest problem I encountered when talking to people, as a poet myself, who uh, write poetry predominantly in print. It's going, yeah, but as a print poet, I can send it to X magazine and I know that their audience is going to read it. But what kind of avenues are there for actually getting your work out there 
when you're working in a digital environment. Yeah. Um, did you want to take that one, Gemma, or should? Um, yeah, just yeah. briefly. Um, yeah. I think so. I became a staff reader for a magazine called Syntax and Salt, which is based in the US. And that was basically just from, I think, from Twitter, just they wanted more readers. So I applied um, and then they made me a staff reader. I've, I've actually just been a guest editor for our first poetry issue. Brilliant. Yay. Yeah, which is something that would never have happened if if not for, you know, trawling Twitter. Yeah. And I know it's not necessarily um, lucrative in terms of money, but it still amazes me that there's, it feels like there's more places to submit works to um, that I get rejected from. <laughs> <laughs> um, We've all been there. We've all been there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um and also read other people's work like oh gosh tumblr and live journal um the poetry curated live journals and tumblers a decade ago were just i read so much contemporary american poetry that i just don't think i would have had exposure to unless i'd known about it already and was already seeking it but then i just learn all, all the, you know kind of like the same sorts of names would come up and then eventually you'd go out and start buying books by people if you could afford it and realizing oh wow there's actually a lot of good stuff out there yeah and then reading more makes you a better writer and then i i tend to be one of those people where if i'm reading shit loads i i read end up writing lots as well so yeah fantastic I'm I've noticed as well in terms of poetry, a lot of online journals are now taking a lot of digital work as well. I've yeah. seen work on VoiceWorks, which is yep. for people under 25. Cordites have done a digital issue. There's a place in Sydney called Subdin, and they publish a lot of digital work on their websites as well. So I've I think recently had a poem been... published by them. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, I, sh I should have screen shared it before. <laughs> <laughs> I guess from my point of view, I've been really lucky, incredibly lucky actually, to have formed close networks, um, you know, throughout my career and that those networks consist of a range of quite decent people from right across the digital writing and publishing sphere and that um, they have a good knowledge of my work and what I've kind of, what I'm setting out to achieve. So that's really good in terms of submitting because then the cognitive load is a bit less. They kind of, you know, don't come to it going, what are those weird punctuations and symbols in that? What should be a poem, you know? And yeah. I, I I mean, beyond language poetry or beyond traditional conventions that are now established that people go, this is what makes good poetry. So I'm lucky in that. But what I also love to do is go find like a little experimental kind of publishing venture who know nothing about my work and submit to it because then you go, what I'm doing stands on its own merits. You know, it's not because I've published here before, people know my name, people know what to expect. Then it's it's something where you just have to go, here you go. It's like I'm submitting for the first time ever in my career. And I love that. And I love, I think part of me subverting what I do constantly, trying not to do the same thing over and over again, is that I want it to be presented fresh. You know, I, I, I've never wanted to be a career-based artist or a career-based writer. I've always wanted to reinvent and, and evolve, not just for the sake of it and not just use, to use tech for the sake of it, but to just see, you know, what you can get in terms of learning, in terms of play, in terms of exploration, and what you can create. And that's, yeah, so I, I'm lucky on both sides of the, the divide. You know, I have people that understand my work. I'm well known in, in a lot of kind of indie publishing ventures. They, that, uh, the Cordite Digital Poetry Anthology, I have work in that. You know, th that's great. But I also want to go, no, you know, I'll submit under a pseudonym just to see if my work is actually crap and I need to up my game, you know? So, yeah, I, I, I guess I, I kind of traverse both sides. 
All right, we've got, say, five minutes left, and I don't see any questions on the Twitter feed. So I thought maybe we'd wrap up with uh, any advice for people who want to create digital work or want to start playing around with technology but aren't sure where to start. Uh, from my side, play. Play with absolutely anything. Go outside and, you know, find sticks and try and make a tree diagram and, you know, scroll some stuff in the dirt, write, experiment, read, find a hinge, rewrite, um, build characters, plot, structure, mechanics in in whatever you can get your hands on. Don't go, oh, my God, I have to become a digital writer. I have to have access to all this technology. Get out your mobile phone, you know, use your calendar to, to do a writing prompt that you'll use three years in the future. You know, just seriously go balls to the wall, do whatever. <laughs> or ovaries to the wall, let's be correct there. Um, <laughs> and, and, and seriously, just just go for it, you know, just play, submit, even if you're not sure about the work, you know, just just see what sticks. See, if, if you're trying to, you know, publish, just see, come at, speak at conferences like this, come to conferences like this, you know, immerse yourself in as many different areas and avenues that you can and then just see what comes out. And if you get negative feedback, take it on board, but don't let it crush you, you know, because feedback is feedback. But if you orient yourself in such a way that you go, you will take it on board and that it it is something that is valuable, but keep going, just keep pushing, keep playing, keep exploring. That that would be my... Yeah, and... You touched on something important there as well, and that's sharing your work. A little while ago, um, I helped co-direct a literary festival here, and we had an event of comic artists, and one of them had explained that she'd gone through a period of depression where she didn't see her work as being good enough, so she just didn't share it. And the downside to that she found years later is that she missed all these opportunities to grow as an artist because every time she shared her work, she learned something from it. So even if you don't like what you're doing, put it out in the world anyway. Yes. There's something you're going to learn from it and you can grow from it and create something better next time. There's And, and people will resonate with it. Like yeah, people, exactly. you know, you'll find collaborators, you'll find a community. Yeah, and there's this attitude anyway that to share and publish your work, it's got to be perfect, but it's never going to be perfect. You're <laughs> always going to be learning. The next thing you make will always be a bit, a little bit better than the last because you'll be a different person for the next work. Absolutely, yeah. Um, advice. Um, I guess start with the page and a pencil or a pen and then write a line and then try to find really unusual ways of representing that line. So if like li trying to literally make those words pop out of that page, um, I think is probably what led me to use things like twine. Um, but yeah, um, read lots, play lots of indie games because I, I think um, in Western culture, play is still looked upon as a waste of time. But play and failure, you learn so much from those two activities. So it's while it is hard um, getting rejections when you're submitting work constantly, you should totally keep submitting work constantly. Yep, yep. yep. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, it's, yep. it is, it's gonna, and it, there will be days when it does get you down, but just keep doing it and look at it as an opportunity to ask yourself, okay, this has been rejected how many times? Um, what about this piece is not working? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. I think the thing I'd, I'll finish on too is what you said about writing a line. For me, I've never real, I've never done, thought about the technology I want to use first. It's always been the words. And then it's been, yep. after that, it's play and creativity and going, What's the best way I can represent this work? This is this is what I've written. This is the theme that I'm trying to get across. What's the best tools I can use to share that message? Yep. Awesome. Great points to end on, girls. Fantastic. All right. And with that, we might wrap up. So uh, thank you for tuning in.
Um, you can continue to tweet us on the hashtag if you want to. That's DWF18. Thanks, so all. Thanks, everyone. Oh, <laughs> there he is. Beautiful. Yeah, she was sitting on my lap. <laughs>